Welcome to the Football Show and this Legends special. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome a two-time European Cup winner and a captain no less of Nottingham Forest, John McGovern. John, welcome to the programme. Um, a European Cup alongside you, it must have seemed uh, so far away from your thoughts when you started out in football. Well, obviously, you, you start playing football because you, you just love to play and run and chase the ball around. Um, I then obviously harboured more feelings for the game as I grew older, um, although I only started playing football for the team when I was 15. And you hope somewhere along the line, you know, you can become a professional footballer. Like most kids, you know, I used to have my heroes, Dennis Law, Jimmy Greaves, you know, they, they were my two real heroes, both strikers. So, of course, as a, as a boy, I wanted to become a striker. <laughs> I've got to ask you, um, when people say John McGovern, they automatically think Brian Clough because it, <laughs> it seemed to everyone that you were attached to the hip. Well, he obviously signed me for Hartlepool United when I was uh, a 16 year old. Um, then I followed him down to Derby County. Um, he did actually want me to follow him down to Brighton as well, but that's the one <laughs> move that I turned him down on. And then just to teach me a lesson, he took me to Leeds United, um, which wasn't a pleasant experience. And then obviously rescued me once again from Leeds United to captain Nottingham Forest, where obviously I had the, the best time of my life really as a player. What made him so special? He was different. He was unique. He just said things in a different way. Um, I think he approached coaching players with a very simple kind of uh, psychology, but absolutely brilliant at making you feel comfortable as a player when you walked out onto a football field. And as we know, it's, Management is 90% psychology with the players, getting them in the mood, getting them in the right frame of mind, telling them about the dedication that's needed, trying to educate them. So from an educational point of view, of course, all footballers know how the game is played. But sometimes it's how you say what you say. And Clough had that off to an absolute T. So, so that when the teams that he put out there went out to play football, the opposition knew that this team aren't going to give up. This team will go right through to the final whistle. Gordon Strachan used to say that when you were younger and a manager would give you a, a rollicking, um, there was a reaction, there was a, I'll go out there and, and, and prove him wrong. He said, as he got older, he got wiser <laughs> as to what the manager was doing. Does that resonate with you? Well, I think you either try to prove Clough wrong or you try to prove him right. Um, <laughs> but you benefited either way. So yeah, it's one of those situations where, um, yeah, if he gave you a really fierce rollicking, if he'd known you for a while, he knew you could take that. Usually when he'd met you for the first time was the time where he'd test you out and find out what your character was like. And it would be a real verbal onslaught. However brief, he would look at the reaction he was gonna get from you. And this is what I learned, you know, the, obviously when I signed for him for the fourth time <laughs> and then got the hundredth rollicking of my career playing for him and that I understood, you know, it is to get the right reaction from me. And it always did. Do you remember those words of wisdom from him like it was yesterday? Well, I remember the first meeting uh, because if you're talking about the, the 60s as it was, the, the, the Rolling Stones were one of the top bands and of course I had shoulder length hair because I thought Mick Jagger was just absolutely brilliant. So I'm thinking if the football doesn't work out, maybe, maybe <laughs> the next Mick Jagger will emerge. But, you know, obviously that never happened. But uh, the first time I met him was after, a, I think, a Thursday night training session and the trainer said, stand in line, boys, we've got a new manager. Um, he's brought his assistant along, Peter Taylor, who'd like to say hello to you. And, and of course, I was the only one with shoulder length hair. Everybody else is short back inside. So I stood at the end and he came along the line, shook hands, shook hands, and then came to me and went, stand up straight, get your shoulders back and get your hair cut. You look like a girl. <laughs> and it was like, what's this? <laughs> Did you sense as a player, even at Hartlepool, that he had something? He was different. No doubts. I mean, I had relations, I had uncles, and uh, my friends' dads and everything like that. I'd never met anybody like him. Um, so I'm 15 and obviously I'm very naive, but I'd never met anyone like him. But, you know, I'm 66 now and I've still never met anybody like him. So, so that kind of impact that he had on me was, this guy is definitely different. Um, and maybe had a little bit of, you know, an allure to him, you know, a little bit of something mysterious. Um, 
and I just obviously enjoyed working for him. You get in the first team in Hartlepool, start to get those regular games. It's vital to a youngster. Um, what happened to get that move on to Derby? Well, obviously, Clough and Taylor um, took over a, a side that had been struggling the season before. Um, get them up to, I think, eighth in the league at one stage or sixth in the league at one stage of the season. So they've had a tremendous turnaround from being relegation candidates to almost getting closer to the top of the league. So that success brought some attention from other clubs and, and Clough and Taylor left and went down to Derby County. Um, a word was passed on to me not to do anything silly by going anywhere else and inevitably a year later I end up down at Derby County um, which was a move which my mum really was, was pleased about because my died, dad died when I was 11 so there was my mum, my brother and me, my sister had moved over to California um, and it was a case of, I think, she felt a few heartaches in Hartlepool, so said, if you move with your football, son, I'm going to move with you. So the strange thing about that move is that, you know, I never became homesick in, in Derby because my mum and my brother have both moved down with me. Um, so obviously that, for me, meant it was quite easy to settle at Derby County because uh, I've literally the whole family's moved. Yeah. Did you feel, even at that young age, when you were at Derby, because your family's moved with you, a sense of responsibility? Well, obviously, my mum especially, you know, I just, uh, I thought if I'm earning, you know, some money, I can give her some money because um, I think that's what you should do, you know. I mean, she used to say to me, oh, I don't want anything. I said, no, you're taking it, you know, that's, you've looked after me, now I'm going to look after you, if it's possible. So, so I always paid my way, even from like 16 years of age, <laughs> I've always contributed to what's going on in the house. Um, Thankfully, I'm still able to do it now. So, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't feel a, it was a burden because my mum is one of these survivors. I mean, she's 92 now and, and would embarrass you and me by taking us on in a race and beating us. You know, she's just a phenomenal force. And, uh, you know, she's been an inspiration for me, especially in the early days when, you know, I can't ask my dad. I can't ask my uncles. They've, they've never been involved with football. Did your family retain a sense of Scotland, a real good foundation of it? Well obviously my mum had to try and make a living when we first moved down to Hartlepool when I was seven years of age so when it came to the school holidays of course I was shipped back up to Bowness where my grandmother lived, <laughs> uh, lived and, uh, and that's where I actually first started kicking a ball around because captain in the school rugby team and cricket team didn't seem to show much grace or favour with the lads in Bowness who looked at me a little bit strange, you know, what, what's that round ball, that oval ball doing, you know what I mean? And then uh, a polite invitation, you know, do you want to come in and join in with us, son? You know, and it was, uh, I was delighted because uh, my brother and I used to be typical, two years, two years difference and always fighting against each other. So, so I formed a new um, band of friends in Bowness, started to play the football there and uh, just loved the company, loved the humour, um, and, and socially it was brilliant for me. There's so many uh, rich parts of your career that I think many a footballer um, you know, would love to have lived even half of it. Derby County must have been a special time because I can remember even as a boy, you know, looking at the players that were playing at Derby at the time, you know, you, I was collecting the chewing gum yeah. cards and you're looking at this great side. What was it like when you first joined? Well, obviously, I'd, I'd been at Hartlepool and I'd, you know, I'd played a couple of seasons there. And the season after Clough left, we won promotion for the first time in Hartlepool's history, which for me was magnificent. You know, I mean, the, the £40 bonus we got each was magnificent as well. If the chairman hadn't had taken 20 quid off us to pay for some club suits that weren't worth a fiver, um, that slightly took the shine <laughs> off it. But then I, I go to Derby County. One of the first games I see is, is Derby County in a League Cup replay against Chelsea at the baseball ground. And before then, I thought I was a footballer. And I watched this game, just having arrived from Hartlepool, and saw Dave Mackay playing. And I thought, I thought I was a footballer. <laughs> I'm a long way short <laughs> after watching Dave perform. <laughs> And I watched Dave and people like Roy McFarland and John O'Hare uh, playing for Derby County and Kevin Hector and Willie Carlin, you know, they had a great side. And I thought, I'll have to roll my sleeves up to get into this side. Uh, because obviously when I first arrived, I'm, I'm in Derby County reserves. 
which might have been fine for some people, but I don't want to stay in the reserves. That's not why I came here. So there was a lot of dedication, a lot of hard work put in. And then I got a break by uh, playing a game in midfield in a wide right position. But eventually I broke into the side and at the suggestion of Peter Taylor, moved to play central midfield, where again, my ability to pass the ball with both feet, I think benefited both myself and the side. Forgive me for this question. Why or oh, why did you join Leeds United? <laughs> I look back and I think, yeah. If you if you if you know known the reaction that I got when I went there, you know, it, it was one of those moves that Dave signed Bruce Rioch because he's he's made a statement as manager of Derby County saying I need more goals from midfield. So, and he signs Bruce Rioch. Now I know Bruce Rioch's going to get goals, and he, again he's coming to a good side. So slightly different style from myself. I'm more a defensive player. He's a more attacking player. So I got left out once, got back in the side, got left out again. And again, even though it's the odd game, I, I don't want to be not playing in the side. Clough gets the job at Leeds, takes me to Leeds, um, tells me I'm not going to get a good reception from the supporters <laughs> because... <laughs> now, that was one statement that was absolutely 100% true. You know. uh, just the reaction of the Leeds fans, you know, when I, when I go out to make my debut and they're booing me before I've kicked a ball, you know. <laughs> I thought this isn't going to be easy. <laughs> and Clough's already told me that. He said, listen, he said, I don't think it's going to be easy. He said, he said, but he said, uh, he said, I've signed you. He said, Bremner's suspended. I've got Mick Bates and Terry Yorath are my other two options, but I've signed you, so I'm going to have to play you. But I don't think you're going to get a good reception. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to hang me from the main stand, I think, the Leeds United supporters. So I failed miserably at Leeds. Yeah, and, and strangely enough, you know, I, the, the movie came out, Damned United, and it really kind of was a, a, a harsh portrayal of Brian Clough at times and a harsh portrayal of, you know, Leeds United. Were you there to sample the madness of the 44 days, throw your medals in the bin? I mean, it, it, you know, it's folklore, that and he story. Did, he did actually make that statement because I asked Norman Hunter uh, <coughs> and he said, yeah, he definitely, you know. And I think because Peter Taylor wasn't with him at the time that, you know, he didn't have anybody to sort of rein him in. Um, and say to him, I don't think you should say that to footballers, you know. You can tell them they've played badly, you can tell them you think you're, they're rubbish, he says, but, you know, I think Peter Taylor would have said, you can't call them cheats, they've just won the league championship. And although their physical intimidatory tactics were part of the reason for that, whereas Clough would have liked them to have just played their way to the title, it didn't work for him and, and obviously it was impossible for me. Yeah. Um, and the last game I actually played when I think every single supporter in the, the ground was booing me. Um, brought my good lady to tears because uh, she was obviously sat in the stands where she can't do anything about it. Um, and all I did at the end of the match was go in the supporters club, which she said, you're not going in there. And I said, no, I am. I'm going to have a half a Guinness. And I walked in and they were, <laughs> they were still booing me as I walked in. And I walked up to the bar, ordered half a Guinness. And they were still booing and the odd beer mat came flying my way. And I finished my half a Guinness and I slowly walked out. And when I got outside, my good lady Anne said, don't you ever do anything like that to me again. <laughs> and I said, I told you you should wait in the car. And she said, I wasn't waiting in the car. So I left Ellen Road after having faced them and gone in the supporters bar and had a drink because I knew they couldn't beat me. If they think that, you know, they're going to destroy me as a footballer, you know, I knew that could never happen. Uh, oh. Just I loved the game too much. And obviously it's, it's not nice when your own supporters are booing you, but to boo me before I've even kicked a ball, you know, and some of the players actually, when I passed the ball to them, would slow down and let it run out of play um, and make it look as if it was a bad ball. So I didn't have anybody to help me at all. No support from the supporters, no support from the players. And the one thing that came out of that situation with, with Clough and Leeds was, uh, and I think that people should remember this, is that when Don, Don, Don Revy, at the end of the film, the Damn United, says to him, well, Brian, what were you trying to achieve? And, and Clough says, well, I wanted to do it better than you, Don. And, and Don, says, Don Revy says, oh, you couldn't do it better than me, Brian. I only lost four league games. You know, well, about 
three years later at Nottingham Forest, Brian Clough's won the First Division Championship and we only lost three league games. Was that the lowest point for you before you get to the ultimate? Well, absolutely, because, you know, Brian Clough was lucky in one sense because he walks out of uh, Ellen Road with a £90,000 payoff and a new Mercedes car. You know, I'm, <laughs> so, sorry, I'm left there. Now, what do I do? Um, <laughs> this is before freedom of contract. <laughs> I was told of two offers that came in for me from Carlisle and Norwich, which there was a difference of £25,000 in the offers. But the Leeds United secretary said, you can go to either club. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> if I'd have been a bit shrewder in those days, I'd have said, well, look, I'll go to the one that's offering more money, but I want some of that money, is it? Tell me how special Nottingham Forest was for you. You know, walking in the doors, did you sense this was a sleeping giant? Not really, because obviously I'd, I'd been at Derby County just a few years earlier, you know, and won the First Division Championship, you know, which Nottingham Forest hadn't done. Um, got to the semi-final of the European Cup. So, you know, it's something that I'd already achieved um, at Derby County that was the highest honour in the game, winning the League Championship. Um, but when I arrived at Nottingham Forest, um, it was quite strange because I used to travel in to train with John O'Hare. And Brian Clough was on his own at this time. Peter Taylor was still at Brighton. And I said to John O'Hare one morning, I said, uh, I think he's going through the motions. And John O'Hare kind of questioned that and said, no, no, he isn't, you know, he's got a good reaction from the, and I said, no, I know he's got a good reaction from the players. But, you know, in the search for perfection, I knew there was just that spark missing from Brian Clough and his approach to taking the players. And when Peter Taylor arrived, it was like, light the blue touch paper and stand well back. <laughs> and, then, and then things really started to happen. Obviously, Peter Taylor was the best recruiting officer, if you'd like to call him that now, or scout or, or talent spotter. And he would sign a number of players that ended up being brilliant talents to add to the burgeoning talent that we had at Nottingham Forest in the shape of John Robertson, Martin O'Neill, Tony Woodcock, Ian Boyer, and Viv Anderson, five players that are there, five players that have got masses of talent, but nobody can bring it out of them. So they've made contact with the right man as well, because with their ability, you've got five players that are gonna go on and win European Cups. So, you know, that was one way where Clough and Taylor were, you know, a little bit fortunate. Um, but those players were there and you would have called them journeyman football at the time. You know, then the inspiration comes from Clough. The inspiration Clough gets from Taylor's added, you know, and then we couldn't fail because after winning promotion from the second division, I know you need to strengthen your squad, but we sign Peter Schilt, arguably the best goalkeeper in the country, Archie Gemmell, quick as lightning midfield player, obviously to offset my lack of pace in that area. <laughs> and we signed Kenny Burns from Birmingham, a striker. And Clough puts him at centre half and everybody goes, what? Kenny Burns at centre half, you know. And I asked Kenny, I said, you ever play centre half before? He said, I filled in there once. <laughs> <laughs> so then as soon as Kenny Burns and Archie Gemma and Peter Shilton arrive, you've brought in three massive talents to the talent that's already there. So we can't fail, can we? <laughs> Strangely enough, in that year, you know, we're looking at that Nottingham Forest side and you're winning game after game. People are thinking, this, how, how long can this go on? Well, I that mean, was the consensus of opinion, I think, from the media. Look, they've just scraped up. They, only, they didn't win the, the second division championship. They scraped up third, you know, and then we go on this run and it's just, it's like a, not a roller coaster ride because it was all going in one direction. It wasn't going up and down. So this is this is like a you know a steam train that nobody can stop. You know, and this and it just got better and better and better. And you know, we we'd signed other people, Larry Lloyd, David Needham. Um, these players were coming at the side, and the but the biggest effect I think was you know if you want to tell people how good Clough was, you know, the five players I mentioned, you know, the Robertsons, O'Neills. Woodcox, Boyers and Andersons, you know, all of a sudden they're starting to play like I don't think they believe they could play. But it's obviously a collection of good players, you know. You can get teams that have got an individual star, but Nottingham Forest grew into a, a great side. 
because all the players involved were capable of doing great things. And you beat a Liverpool team <laughs> at the time that, you know, if, if, if it wasn't Keegan, suddenly it was a Dalgleish, it was a Sunis, you know, you know, it was an Emlyn Hughes, it was, you know, a team that literally was dominating and, and you guys come up with new kids on the block and you take it. Well, Liverpool were the, they were the example that you wanted to follow, you know, they were the benchmark, they, they were the guys that had done it. They're the guys that had won two European Cups in a row uh, before we were in it in the in the 78-9 season you know and obviously Shankly was the guy that had built this this fortress this amazing place called Anfield and the reputation of I think British football went through the roof because of Liverpool's domination not just in England but obviously in Europe as well um, and obviously when I think Clough or, or, or Shankly met, you know, I think that the respect was enormous um, between them. And I, I spoke to Bill Shankly once or twice myself, um, which is quite strange, but because obviously in those days players weren't even allowed to talk to the media. And, <laughs> but I just happened to be in his company once or twice, and, and this is as close to Clough as you can get. This, this guy is just his manner, just his, his aura, is, is similar to Clough. Um, Tell me about the, the European games, because to be a Scot, to be a man who lifts the European <laughs> Cup, uh, you're one of only three, Billy McNeil, Graham Souness, John McGovern. Um, what does that mean to you? Yeah, the, the European games were, I mean, they're, they're fantastic adventures, if I can simplify it to basically that. If you, if you love playing football, you want to play in front of a big crowd. I'm, I'm sure it's the same with you know, rock stars who you know, play play musical instruments better than anyone else. They want to play in front of big crowds because it gives them a similar excitement that it gives the crowd that are actually stood there watching them. And and I think you have an appreciation for the supporters as well because if you've got you know 20,000 of your own fans bellowing your club's name, it does lift you. And some people have said to me, yeah, oh, but it doesn't really lift me. You know, what are you in the game for then <laughs> if it doesn't lift you it certainly lifted me and it certainly lifted the boys at Nottingham Forest because the support we used to get was phenomenal and even away from home it was phenomenal and thankfully you know the behavior of the fans when we used to travel was brilliant as well we were disciplined enough under Clough to know that you know we never disgraced ourselves when we were abroad in any way shape or form so you are representing the country and although that's not really apparent to you at the time because your focus is on just winning football games, you know, you are representing the country. And I thought we did it magnificently. Yeah. When did you think, this is on, we can win this? Well, the strange thing about when we qualified after winning the league in 77, 78 was that we're all sat listening to the radio together, waiting for the draw, you know, and, and there's, of course there's, I fancy going to Spain, you know, I fancy going to, you know, Barcelona or, you know, whoever won it, Real Madrid, you know, oh no, I want to go to Paris, you know, and we draw Liverpool. <laughs> and everybody goes, oh shit, <laughs> Liverpool, we don't even get out of the country, we're supposed to be in the European Cup, you know, so, so we're all going, oh, you know, Liverpool, you know, of course Clough turns it around straight away and he said, yeah, but you realise what they'll be saying in their dressing room after you beat them in the League Cup, you beat them for the league last season, not them again. So Clough turned it into a real positive for us because he said, we're the last team that Liverpool wanted to draw. You know, and they're European champions. So of course, we've got to play Liverpool. First legs at the city ground. Gary Birtles, another addition to the squad who's come out of long eating. <laughs> <laughs> Where? <laughs> he scores a goal, we win 2-0. Colin Barrett, our left back, scores a goal, which is like unheard of. So. Shock result, we beat Liverpool 2-0 in the first leg, the European champions. We go to Anfield, and then when we needed to put the shutters up, poof, we put the shutters up. You know, Lloyd, Burns, Shilton, you know, full-backs Frank Gray, and, uh, you know, or Colin Barrett. Um, and obviously we had the, the genius of the team, John Robertson, who would keep the ball for long spells um, to frustrate Liverpool at Anfield. And again, we went there. There were stories about we were drinking beer all the way up to Anfield, you know, which wasn't true. We only had a couple. <laughs> um, 
and then manage to go out and get a nil-nil draw and get through to the next round. But once you've beaten the European champions, I think the players just got that real bit of confidence in themselves. You mentioned a player there who's created a goal in the European Cup final and scored a winning goal in the European Cup final. How good was Robbo? John Robertson. I'm, I'm smiling because, you know, a lot of people said, he doesn't look like a footballer. <laughs> you know, I said, look, he's a little fat bugger, but he's a genius once you give him a football. And a lot of Forest fans used to say to me, I love watching John Robertson. And I said, so do I. And they said, no, but you're playing. I said, no, I love watching him as well. <laughs> And he was one of these artists, and I'll call him an artist because, you know, he had sublime talent. Um, when people talk about great players, they, they love a comparison. Well, who was he like? You know, and I said, in the modern game, he's probably like Ryan Giggs with two good feet. Because I've seen Ryan Giggs do everything with his left foot. I saw John Robertson do everything and more with both feet. Create goals, score goals. And his confidence on the ball was, was nothing short of incredible to the point where we go to Anfield, f second leg of the European Cup final, and in front of the cop, an hour before kickoff, when we've gone out to test the surface to see what boots we want to wear, the cop's full, bane for our blood, and John Robertson goes up and pretends to take a penalty in front of the cop <laughs> <laughs> before kickoff. And we're saying to him, I don't think you need to wind them up anymore, <laughs> Robbo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's sheer, you know, sportsmanship, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And all the lads are laughing, you know, and they, we've got a game coming up against the European champions. So that was the kind of spirit we had in the side. The ball over, Francis scores and you walk up. Does the enormity of that sink in or is it weeks, months, years later for you? Well, the, the first thing that happens is that, you know, you haven't practised anything and nobody's told you where to go. And we're kind of milling around on the pitch with hundreds of uh, supporters, coaches, you know, whoever it is. And, and then someone comes and said, oh, you've got to come up here. And, and literally through the crowd points the way where you go up the steps to receive the trophy. Obviously, I appreciate I'm the captain, so I've got to lead them up there. And then no one said what the protocol is regarding getting hold of that cup, because I just want to grab it. <laughs> but, but I'm a polite guy, so I thought, I'll let the uh, UEFA official uh, present me with the cup, but then I'm not sure whether he was sure of it. So, so we did a bit of this, oh, no, no, I'll wait till you give it. And I, <laughs> so there was a little hesitancy. And then the only thing I wanted to do, because I do like things to be right, is I, I looked to see where the badge was and turned it round before I lifted it up to show our fans who are absolutely, you know, just going berserk um, in that lovely night in and, Munich. And the funny thing is, it's just like, you lot at Nottingham Forest. You win it once, and then you go back and win it again. <laughs> the second year, I, I think. I think the second time is always more difficult because you know the pressure is on you then as the champions. But when people talk about pressure and they talk about you know oh when you're top of the league or when you play in the semi-final of this, you know, and I said you're talking about things. I said that some players never ever achieve semi-finals of this, finals of that. I said you know if you're at the other end of the league. I said, such as when I was at Hartlepool United, I said in, in the late 60s, I says, and at the end of the season, the manager comes in and he's got a sheet of A4 paper and it's got two columns. One says, players retained, players released. And he just pins it up on the notice board. I said, and I'm sat next to players who have got three kids, mortgages, and they're physically shaking. And you tell me there's pressure playing in European Cup semi-finals. <laughs> There's absolutely no pressure whatsoever. Up at the top of the league winning, tr no pressure whatsoever. Losing your job, as I saw some players do at Hartlepool in the, in the late 60s, I know that was pressure. Is it the one disappointment that you never got a cap? I would have walked up the M74 over broken glass to get one cap for Scotland. Um, I know there were times I was playing well enough. There was some great competition. Don't get me wrong, Willie Carr, Asa Hartford, Graham Sooners, Archie Gemmell, Bruce Rioch. The list was endless. The midfield players, Billy Bremner, <laughs> better not leave Billy out. <laughs> um, so, so there was great competition and, and the role that I played perhaps was 
a specialised role at, at, at Nottingham Forest where I did become a, a kind of defensive midfield player that helped just keep the back four tight against the opposition. But I just wished I'd got one cap uh, because that would have been the proudest moment of my life. And the last point here, I started with your association with Brian Clough. I'm going to finish on it. Was there even one moment where he maybe at the end of your career, maybe towards the end of his, where the two of you had that quiet word and maybe said, ah, it was special, you were special? I mean, he, he was the special one, <laughs> regardless of what Mourinho might say. Uh, he was different. Um, I was just very fortunate that I met him when I was a young boy at school, hoping to become a footballer because I couldn't have fast-tracked anywhere else apart from meeting Brian Clough and him looking at me alongside Peter Taylor. We should never ever forget that because Peter Taylor's the one that said, hey, let's get that skinny kid signed up, you know. So, so their kind of uh, union or their partnership, to be included in that as a 16-year-old, um, meant that I was, or I did have that element of luck. Is it nice to be near the old girl again? <laughs> <laughs> it does bring back happy memories. Um, and the one thing that people used to say to me was, you know, because I wasn't, I wasn't the biggest. They said, I bet it was difficult to lift it. You know, I said they could have put an elephant in it and I still lifted it. The adrenaline's running that fast at the time. No, it's great to have won something like that. It's great to bring it back in the country. And it's great that we behaved the way we did, both the supporters and the players, because we we're a credit to Britain. John McGovern, it's, it's been an absolute joy. I mean, <laughs> for me, as a kid, watching you guys play was magnificent. This seems like a two-minute interview. It's been a joy. Thank you. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure, Peter.